Hey everyone, um, I am author Mary Mancusi, uh, author of uh, The Camelot Code, Dragon Offs, uh, lots of other books, and I'm so excited to be able to do this with you guys today. Uh, usually as an author, I go into schools, I talk in cafeterias or auditoriums or classrooms and uh, do this presentation. And now I'm gonna get to do the same exact presentation, but we're gonna do it online virtually. So I know not maybe as fun as having it like live at school, but we're gonna make the best of it and we're gonna make this a lot of fun. So uh, we're going to get started. I'm going to share my screen so we can be ready. So let's do that. And now we can go. Okay, great. All right. So uh, I think the first thing I want to do before we really get into all the stuff we're going to talk about today is give you a little intro about me. Now we don't know each other right now. So uh, I'm going to give you some little facts that you might not know about me. And the first one was that I am not always, I have not always been a full-time author. In fact, I was a TV news producer for many, many years before I got into writing. And I was an investigative producer, which meant I got to do all the like scams and rip-offs and go undercover with secret video. And it was a lot of fun. It was a great job. And uh, I actually won two Emmy Awards as a TV news producer. So that was sort of my formal life before I became an author. Uh, now I'm a full-time author, meaning I do it all, all day, you know, don't do anything else but write books and promote them. Uh, and I've had 28 books published of all sorts of different kinds, like kids, teens, adults. Uh, these are some of my more recent books, the Camelot Code series, as I showed you before, Dragon Ops, and we're going to get into all these a little bit more. But uh, just to give you a little background of where I came from and where I am now. Another thing you might not know about me is I live in Austin. I think many of you are probably from Texas as well. So maybe some of you are Austin peeps. So, hey, Austin. Uh, and uh, I have lived here for 10 years and made Texas my home. Uh, but I'm originally from Massachusetts, way, way up in the Northeast, uh, a much smaller state than Texas. And because I come from Massachusetts, of course, I like the Patriots. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. But now I have to change the slide because Tom Brady actually just left for us for Tampa. And I'm so sad about that. But what are you going to do? Uh, another thing you might not know about me is I love video games. In fact, lots of my books have to do with gaming because I personally am such a big gamer. Uh, here's some of the games that I've always enjoyed playing. Uh, World of Warcraft, Skyrim, Beat Saber on the PlayStation VR is one of my new favorites. It's actually like a workout as well as a video game, which is really cool. Uh, but I, one thing I really like about most games like Skyrim or World of Warcraft is they are all about storytelling. So even though you're playing the game, it's like you're being brought along into a story and you're just basically living the story. So I think sometimes parents, maybe uh, teachers, sometimes they underestimate the importance of video games in some ways if they're telling a story because you can really learn story from video games. That's just my opinion anyway. Uh, another thing you might not know about me is I am a mom as well. This is my daughter, Avalon. She goes to Rooster Springs Elementary, uh, and uh, she's also a dancer, so she's on a dance team, uh, and uh, she likes to compete, and she's very, very flexible, as you can see, and she likes kitty cats, but we don't have any kitty cats at our house. We have two doggies. This is Minnie and Mesquite, my little babies, so, uh, and it's actually thundering out right now as I'm doing this, and uh, they are a little bit freaked out, so I had to kick them out of my office because they're not liking the thunder. Another thing you might not know about me is I write for Disney. I'm actually a big Disney fan too, so it's really cool to be able to write for them. And I'm gonna tell you about a book that I'm writing for them that not many people know about yet because it hasn't really been officially announced as they haven't even finished the cover of the book. But this book is coming out in the fall and it's a Frozen 2 book. It's called Dangerous Secrets and it's the story of Aduna and Agnar. And if you've seen Frozen, you remember Aduna and Agnar are Elsa and Anna's parents. So this is the story of when they were teens and younger and how they met and fell in love and all the problems that uh, came about it. I don't want to spoil it if you haven't seen Frozen 2, uh, but they go into a little bit more about the parents. And this book is the whole prequel backstory of the parents. So that was a really fun uh, book to write because I got to live in that world of Frozen and write their story. So that's one thing I have coming out. The other thing I have coming out soon, and I showed you this before, is Dragon Ops. And Dragon Ops is about the world's very first augmented reality theme park. So imagine a theme park 
that you put on your VR goggles, you have this suit that has all these sensors on it and you walk through and you play the video game as if you're playing it in real life, like a really advanced Pokemon Go. But imagine when you're in the park and it's not open to the public yet, these kids have gotten a sneak peek, uh, the park gets locked down and an AI rogue dragon comes after them and they were determined to win the game at any cost. And so these kids have to fight their way out of the Dragon Ops video game theme park. So that was a really fun one to write. And that comes out very soon. That actually comes out next month in May. So anyway, those are some of the projects that I've worked on. Um, and so now we're going to switch a little gears a little bit. I talked about being an author. Uh, you might want to know what that actually means, how that actually, you know, goes about. And uh, so what does being a writer mean? Well, one thing being a writer means you don't go into the office. Now, I know no one's going into the office right now. Um, but my day to day life is sort of like this quarantine. I stay home and I write from home every day. In fact, some days I don't even bother to get dressed until it's like time to pick up my daughter from school, confession, uh, because you don't have to. You don't have to impress anyone except your dogs and they really don't care what you're wearing your pajama pants. Uh, so I am able to have that luxury of writing from home. So that's one of the things I really love about being a writer as opposed to being a TV producer where I was always on the go. Um, another thing about being a writer is you get to make stuff up for a living and people pay you for it. I mean, what could be better than that? You have characters that you just create off the top of your head, stories about these characters. These are some of mine, Arthur, Sophie, Guinevere from Camelot Toad, and I get to create them and then I get to put them in the world and then they end up in a book that's in bookstores or Target in this case. That's my little niece, Nina. Uh, she's very excited that she sees Camelot Code at Target. And then the best part about it, of course, though, is not having a book sitting boring at a bookstore, but to have people reading the book. So the stuff that you came from your head ends up on a page, goes to a bookstore, and then ends up in the hands of readers. And that's really the best part about being an author is having readers fall in love with your story, get lost in your world. Maybe they have a little bit better of a day because they read your book. And so that's what I love about being an author. So does that sound like a cool gig? Because <laughs> if it does, I'm going to give you some uh, advice if you want to become an author someday and kind of how give you the story of how it happened for me. And it's a long process. It's not something that just wake up one day and like, I want to be an author. I'm going to do that. I think it actually starts when you're really young. And so I have this slide up here that says start now, not tomorrow. And I think that's really important. Now, if you were a lawyer, they would never let you into a courtroom, uh, you know, when you're 12. Uh, and if you're a do doctor, like, like you want to be a doctor, they're not going to let you on the operating table as a 11 year old. Uh, but you know, if you are a writer, you can write now all you don't need any equipment, it's just a pencil and paper or a computer. And you that's all you need to get started. And the ideas you have now are going to be ideas that will stay with you for your rest of your life. It's not like suddenly when you get older, you get better ideas, you might get better at actually writing and learning your craft and just you know, creating a story. But the ideas in your head now are totally totally legit and uh, they totally carry through with you. Now this is a picture of me when I was about six years old and even back then I, I wasn't a very good writer. I couldn't really write very well but what I would do because I still had stories in my brain was I would draw pictures and I would have my mom transcribe the stories. I would tell her the stories and she would write them down. Here's a picture I drew a very long time ago, uh, probably about that age, maybe even a little younger, of a dragon and a dog. And the dragon is spewing something. I don't know if it's fire, chocolate, salsa. We, it's really, maybe he's just puking. I can't really tell. Uh, but you know, like it's just this idea of uh, a drawing I did. And the cool thing about this drawing is basically that I still write dragon books. So clearly I liked dragons even when I was that little that I could barely write. And I still had those same ideas about dragons and a dog. I don't really know the storyline, sadly, for this because uh, the text is long gone. Maybe they're going to save the world. We'll, we'll go with that anyway. <laughs> but, um, you know, you can see these ideas from when you're five years old, six years old, and then carry through all the way. Um, the other thing I did a lot when I was young was I read a lot. I was an avid reader, and I hope some of you really like to read as well. These were some of the series that I liked as a kid. Um, the Babysitter's Club, which is still around today, but now it's more of a graphic novel than a chapter series like I had. And then fantasy novels. I put The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe as an example, but I devoured fantasy books. I loved the Lord of the Rings series, for example. Um, I loved uh, this book called Hero in the Crown by Robin McKinley, which was about a girl dragon slayer. Again, dragon 
dragons, dragons, dragons. And so I read so much. And I think that's very important for someone who wants to be a writer. You have to be a reader as well. In fact, Stephen King, who some of you probably know, he's a very famous author, one of the most famous authors in the world. And um, he says, if you want to be a writer, you must do two things above all others, read a lot and write a lot. And I think that is so, so true. Now, this is me as a little bit older. Um, as you could see, I now was writing my own stuff. I would just take a pen and paper and I would write it down and I would still draw these pictures of, to go along with my little short stories. And again, you can see all the influence the reading had on me and the things that I like because you, this is like a warrior and an elf princess and all stuff that you might have found from Lord of the Rings. I was writing about all that fantasy stuff even way back then and now I still do. Now, this is me probably about 12 years old. Um, and uh, next to me is my dog from the time. His name was Raggy. And I put that there because I wrote a story and it was actually a realistic story. This one wasn't a fantasy story about a dog. And I don't have the story. It got lost in the annals of time. Uh, so I just put up my dog because he was really cute anyway. So you can just look at him when I tell you this little story. Uh, but basically at this time I wrote this story and it was a really, really sad story about a dog. Um, and uh, basically I, you know, turned it into my teacher and she's like, this story is so good. And I gave it to my mom to read. My mom's like, oh my gosh, you're such a good writer. This is like the best story ever. And I was feeling pretty good at myself at this point, you know, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm pretty good. And so uh, I was very, very proud of this story. So along this time, my mom met an author, a real author who had a book that was published in the bookstore. And I had never met anyone who had actually been published. I just thought these were these amazing people that like, you know, wouldn't like communicate with us mere humans. <laughs> and so my mom met this woman and she said, you know what, if she, if Mary has something that she wants me to read, I will read it and I will give her my feedback on it. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is my big break. This woman is going to so help my career, my career, right? I'm 12. And I was like, I gave her the story and I'm like, she's going to read it. And she's going to be like, wow, this girl is so talented. I should call my editor in New York. I don't know why she's not published yet. Like, this is going to be the best thing ever. And um, so I waited for the feedback and I waited and I was super excited about it. And I couldn't wait. And then finally she came back to me with her notes and they look something like this. Yeah. I mean, see all those red marks? This isn't exact the story because like I said, it was lost, but this is what it kind of looked like. Like she had scribbled like every line out. She had wrote new words in, she'd moved stuff around, she'd scribbled things out. And it was like, oh my gosh, what happened to my story? And I cried and I cried and I was like, oh no. Oh, my mom's been lying to me this whole time. I'm actually like the worst writer ever. And I was so devastated. I'm like, forget this. I am not going to be a writer. I have no talent for this. And I was a fool to think I could ever succeed in this. So I quit. And uh, yeah, so as you can imagine, that didn't stick because here I am. So after a while, though, I pulled the manuscript out, the, the short story out that she had scribbled on, and I looked at some of her edits, and I realized that maybe one or two of them weren't so bad, and so I kind of revised, and I did some things, and I changed some things around, and I took her suggestions, and I finally finished revising this short story. And I looked at it, and I thought, you know, weirdly, weirdly, the story is actually kind of better now that I have made all these revisions. And so I entered it in a writing contest and I won second place, but you know, I still won. It was like my first writing award ever. And I was so excited and I was so happy that I took the time to look at her feedback that she had spent so much time writing and take it to heart and realize that maybe I could have room for improvement. In fact, that's what I always say to people now. There's always room for improvement and pizza because I mean, obviously. Uh, <laughs> but I think that's a very important thing to learn. If you want to be a writer, you always are going to be revising. Your first draft is never your final draft. In fact, for a book, I could have like 10 different drafts, 10 different versions of this book before the final one goes into a book. In fact, if even a book my editor loves, you know, she'd be like, this book is amazing. I really love it. Um, here's seven pages of single spaced suggestions for improvements on this book. And then I spend months going back on this book and rewriting, rewriting. So if that's not your thing, you will never make it as an author. But trust me, it's worth doing the revisions every time. Even when I look at them, I'm like, oh, come on, really? Um, when I really look down back at it, I say, oh yeah, she made it better. So there's always room for improvement and there's always room for pizza too. 
All right, so we're going to start our manuscript now. We're going to start our short story, whatever you want to write, whether it's a poem, play, short story, doesn't matter. We're going to start. And what you first need to start with is an idea, of course. I mean, what are you going to write about? And a very famous children's author, Be Beverly Cleary, said, if you don't see the book you want on the shelf, write it. And I think that's a really good start because we want to write books that resonate with ourselves. We want to make sure what we're writing is interesting to us. In fact, a lot of people will tell you in life, write what you know, write what you know. And that is such boring advice. I mean, maybe it works sometimes, but I say, write what you like because you are going to have to be with the story, be with this book for a long time. You better like what you're doing and it's going to come across on the page if you do. So when you're deciding what to write, this is the kind of thing I like to do. So I make a the vision board or I'll just scribble things down of things I like. So for, for example, here's some of the things I like. I like snowboarding. I like video games. I like puppies, dragons, time travel, theme parks, ice cream, sword art online or manga uh, and narwhals. I've never written a book about a narwhal, but how cool would that be? <laughs> um, and then I take this list and I kind of play a little game with myself, like adding three things that don't seem to go together, but maybe would be interesting if they were mashed together. So for example, we have a fantasy, like a sword in the stone, the King Arthur story, which I always enjoyed. We have time travel, that's what that symbolizes. And we have video games. Now, none of those things really have anything to do with each other, but when you mash them together, you get a completely new story. In this case, the Camelot Code, where young King Arthur, before he pulls the sword from the stone, accidentally travels back in time, uh, forward in time to our time. And when he's there, he Googles himself uh, and finds out his destiny and realizes he doesn't want to go back and face all of that bad stuff that's going to happen to him. So he decides to stay in the future. And now it's up to our 21st century kids, Sophie and Stu, uh, to you know, use their video game knowledge because they are big gamers to go back in time and solve Arthurian legend. So three things that don't have anything to do with each other, smashing together for one book. Oh, I can hear the thunder now. All right, uh, another example of this. Um, what if you took a theme park, video games, and dragons? And I think you know where we're going with this one because we already talked about this one, but that is my May book, Dragon Ops. So you're taking three things that just don't go together and you mash them up for something new. And that's one way to come up with a really unique, interesting story idea. All right, so now that you've had your idea, you have to decide where your book takes place. And a lot of times teachers will call that the setting. I like to call it world building because it sounds cooler, you know, like not just, oh, what's the setting of your book, but like, what world do you want to build today? And you can really build anything. The sky's the limit, whether it's like a castle and a fantasy kingdom or an outer space story, or even just a story in your regular, you know, everyday school. It doesn't matter. And the setting is also, and the world building is also all the rules that come with that world. Is there magic in your world? Do people know there's magic in your world? Are there mythical creatures? Uh, is it just like real life? And you get to make all these rules about your world. So really have a sense of where your story takes place, ground it in something, and make up this world that feels really, really real, even if it's really, really fantastical. After that, um, the next step, of course, is to come up with characters. And characters are the most important thing, I think, in a book. In fact, there are plenty of books that I've read, and you probably have had the same experience, where a couple months later, a year later, you know you read the book, and you kind of remember the plot, but you might not even remember how it ends. But what you do remember is the characters, the people in the book, because those are the ones you relate to, because you're a person. And so you really want to make these characters come alive on the page. Uh, and they're going to act differently based on who they are. So if you threw Hermione in the Dragon Ops video game world, things are going to go a lot different than if you threw the wimpy kid in, right? They're going to act differently. They're going to have a totally different experience. So when you have a world, think about how your characters will fit in the world. Are they going to be natural fit into the world? Or are they going to be a fish out of water trying to struggle their way through figuring out this world? Like in Camelot Code, when Arthur goes to the future, he doesn't know what a shower is. He thinks it's like an indoor waterfall. You know, um, when Sophie and Stu go back into medieval times, they realize they didn't use forks, you know, sort of thing like that so you feel like the character is thrown into this world that makes them feel a little bit uncomfortable. Now when you're creating your characters I like to interview them just as if you were interviewing a real person and you can create a character sheet which tells you all about these characters and gives you background information and what you need to know about them when you start writing your book. And some of the things are really basic like hair color, eye color, you know, favorite video games, grade they are in school, do they have any brothers and sisters, but then you can go really deeper like what's their biggest secret? 
what do they not want their parents to know about them? What are they hiding from their best friend? I mean, you can just go really, really deep and figure out who these people are and what makes them tick. And then they're gonna come alive much better on the page. But there are three questions you really need to ask every character um, when you're starting out. And this is actually the beginning, not of character, a little bit of character, but also of plot, which of course is the next thing we have to talk about. So who is my character? What do they want? And what is stopping them from getting it? Because if there's nothing stopping them from getting what they want, it'd be a very boring story. It's like, hi, I'm so-and-so, I want this, and then I went and got it. End of story, very boring. So you need to create that conflict in the story to what's stopping the characters. They need to want something and what's stopping them from getting it. I'll give you an example of Star Wars, which most of, most of you have probably seen. So Luke Skywalker, you know, he's a farmer. He's on a desert planet of Tatooine. He, uh, you know, has to buy some droids for his uncle for their farming business. Okay, that's who he is in the beginning of the story. What does he want? Well, he wants to get off this desert planet. He wants to have an adventure. He wants to be a pilot. He wants to, you know, fight in the intergalactic war. And he has all these desires. But what is stopping him from getting it? Well, he's stuck on a planet. He doesn't have a starship. He doesn't have a way off. He does, his uncle wants him to work on the farm. He is stuck. And so it's not until he gets the invitation uh, through R2-D2, Princess Leia, uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi, all these things start happening that he's able to move forward with what he wants until the end of the movie where he finally, finally gets what he wants when he blows up the Death Star. Sorry if that's a spoiler. I mean, I feel like it's been enough time. <laughs> anyway, so that's some of the things you have to think of. And as you're thinking of them, I would suggest you do a little book report about your story or book. Um, this will save you so much time and frustration later. And I know it's a pain. It's the last thing you want to do when you're starting a story. You just want to dive in and start. But if you have a book report or what they call professionally a synopsis, you will have an outline of where your story goes. What is the beginning of the story? Like the things we talked about. What happens in the middle? What happens at the end? And if you have those three things, you will be able to get through your story. I can't tell you how many beginner writers I have where they're like, uh, I got stuck in the middle and it got really boring and then I had a shiny new idea. So I started that one. And then that same thing happened again and I can never finish a book. If you take the time to create your story summary beforehand, uh, then you will never have that problem. Otherwise, you are gonna get so lost you're going to get stuck in the middle. And I did this for years and years and years. And it's no fun, let me tell you. So now I always have an idea of where I'm going. And you don't have to stick to it exactly. If you like have a new idea halfway through, don't keep yourself to the outline because I have this outline and I can't stray from it. If you get something really good brainstorm, it's okay. It's like taking the scenic route, but you still know where you have to end up at the end. And that's really important. All right, so you get all that stuff done and now you can finally start writing. I know it seems like it takes forever, right? But when you're writing your first draft, this is the kind of fun part because you don't really have to be too serious on a first draft. It's only the first draft. And so I actually like to call it the vomit draft. Basically the idea is you need to get the stuff from your head onto the page in any way possible and preferably as fast as possible, okay? Just turn it all out. Don't worry about things like punctuation, complete sentences, grammar, spelling, any of that stuff. None of that matters at this point. That can always be fixed later in editing. Just get the story out from your head onto the page and then we can, you know, work on it. Now, the reason you do this is because you can always edit something that's bad but you can't edit a blank page. If you just have a white piece of paper, there's nothing you can do with it. If you have a paper that's got just some scribbled thoughts, you can put them together afterwards and, and, and make them better and better. And like I said, there's always room for improvement. And so that's where you go with that. Um, so yeah, don't worry so much. I know some people want to craft each sentence so perfectly the first time around, and then they're only writing like one sentence a day. And they're like, why can't I ever finish my story? Just puke it all out, fix it later. I promise you it's an easier way to do it. And good writing is hard work. I mean, this is not something that's just, you know, blah, I have an idea, I'm gonna write a story, I'm gonna get a book published. It's a lot of stuff goes into this. So don't feel like if you're getting frustrated um, or it's not coming easy that you're doing something wrong or there's something wrong with you. There are days when I sit at my computer and I cannot get a sentence out and it's just struggle, struggle, struggle. And finally, I just go away and play some video games and I, I give myself a break because there are going to be days when your writing is really working for you and there's going to be days when it's not and that's okay too. 
And along the way, you're going to get rejected. Every writer has gotten rejection. And I mean, every writer. Uh, we look at some of the biggies. We got Dr. Seuss. He had 27 rejections before he got his first book published. And we all know how famous he is. Uh, and J.K. Rowling, who wrote a little book called Harry Potter, she said she had loads of rejections before uh, you know, the Harry Potter finally got picked up by a publisher and it didn't even get picked up by that, that much money. It was like 2,500, you know, a British pounds or something like that. It wasn't a big bestseller when it started out. Someone was like, oh, I guess this might be okay. When a lot of other people were rejecting her and like, oh, no one wants to know a story about a boy wizard. That's boring. Uh, wrong. Like half the world wants to know that story. And she could have easily given up at that point. She was a single mom on the British equivalent of welfare and she had a lot going on in her life. And the last thing she needed was to just keep getting rejected over and over again, but she stuck with it. And now she's one of, she might, she might be the richest woman in the world uh, because she had a dream and she wasn't going to let anyone stop her from it. Even the Camelot code got rejected. I think uh, 20, I don't know, 21 times, something like that. I can't remember the exact number, but I had so many publishers say, no, this is not quite for us before Disney picked it up and said, you know, we're going to take this on. And it was really turned out to be, you know, one of those Disney dreams come true, honestly, and because that's the best part about all of this. It only takes one person to say yes, one editor to really believe in you. And uh, then your book gets to be a book, you know, in a bookstore and you have that dream that you've wanted so long. So um, I would say with, any, with anything you do, it is not just writing, you're always going to get rejection, you're always going to get people who maybe don't understand what you're trying to do. But there's only two secrets that you have to know. Uh, and that is to keep calm and to persevere. Now, keeping calm is more of a guideline. I never keep calm. I like freak out about every little thing. And then I calm down later. And that's just sort of me. And so I have to kind of let that go. But perseverance, you know, keeping with it. You never know when it's going to be your turn. And so don't take yourself out of the race prematurely. And along the way, there's going to be haters, doubters, non-believers, and then hopefully there'll be you proving them wrong. Um, this is a book, a popular book, um, and these are one-star Amazon reviews about this book. So if not mine, it probably, uh, I probably have similar, you know, everyone does, but this one is a different book. Uh, it's called, this, right, so this is probably the most boring, unoriginal, and derivative story I've ever read, a weak, pathetic imitation of literature that doesn't even deserve to be called a book, and worst book I have ever read. Now, what book is this? When we do this live, I ask you know, people if they can guess what the book is, but I'm gonna sh show it to you now. But who said this was the worst book I've ever read? And it's Harry Potter. Someone thought Harry Potter was the worst book they ever read. You gotta wonder what they read other than Harry Potter. But yeah, so <laughs> uh, it just shows that there's always gonna be people who don't understand what you're doing. There's gonna be haters. There's going to be people who you know, try to knock you down. But you just have to say, dear haters, I have so much more for you to be mad at. Just be patient. I like to think JK Rowling saying that to all her haters. Anyway, uh, this is a picture of me, a really, 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 really bad picture of me uh, when I was in seventh grade. I am proudly holding something that I don't know what it is. It's like candy or salsa or maybe what that dragon was spewing earlier. <laughs> I don't really know. Uh, but uh, as you can see, I have a very terrible haircut as well. Um, it was sort of in style then, but not, not really, not, not really. And, that, and my, my jean shirt is tucked into my shorts. It's just, it's a bad look, even for the whenever time period this was. But anyway, I put this up here because I want to tell you a story about me at that age. Um, I was going into seventh grade and I had to go to a new school. I had been in a small private school and now I was going to a big public school where everyone else knew each other since kindergarten. And I was super shy back then. And all I wanted to do was be left alone. And so I would sit in the corner at lunch or recess or whatever. And I would draw because I thought if I could just sit and draw, I can get through this, you know, I can make it through the day and someday I won't be in school anymore. <laughs> But you know, of course, the second you try to, excuse me, all right, the second you try to hide in a corner, that's when they all sweep in. No one will leave you alone. And so there was this kid, Eric, that's his real name, <laughs> um, that would come and harass me all the time. Um, he would make fun of my drawings. He would bring other people over to make fun of them. And it just got so awful. Like, I didn't want to go to school anymore after a while because I was just getting bullied and harassed all the time when I just wanted to be left alone to draw. And I thought, what am I going to do? My parents aren't going to let me quit school. So I have to come up with some kind of solution uh, to this problem. So I did finally. And that solution was to quit drawing. 
which is the dumbest solution ever. I mean, why would I do that? I love to draw. Why would I let this kid, Eric, take it away from me? And, and, and now I can't draw to save myself because I stopped doing it. So I lost all the practice I had. And, you know, I am not a good artist today. And, and, and I think back and I'm so mad that I let him do this to me because I don't even know where he is now. Like, I don't know. He could be like, I don't know, wrestling alligator somewhere. Or, I mean, who knows where he is? Hopefully he's reformed and is helping orphan children. But, you know, like, I don't care about this guy. I don't know where he is. He doesn't mean anything to me. And yet I let him, when I was in seventh grade, take away something that I love. And that made me so angry. And so I decided to get my revenge in fiction. And so I wrote a book called Gamer Girl. And in Gamer Girl, it's a very similar situation where the girl goes to a new school and she gets bullied for her art. She's a manga artist, um, though I never did that. And um, you know, she, but because it's fiction, I'm able to give her a happy ending. I'm able to give her coping mechanisms to fight back against the bullies and actually form a manga club at her school and make friends. And she has this happy ending uh, and she gets empowered through her video game. Like all this great stuff happens to her because it's fiction. I was able to do that. So I felt it was like good kind of therapy for me. Like, you know, I had this horrible thing that happened to me as a kid and I was able to write about it in, as an adult. And that's kind of where I thought it would end. But Interestingly enough, after it got published, I started getting emails and drawings from people all over the world, all over the country. And they were like, hey, I'm just like Maddie. My parents got divorced. I had to go to new school. I'm being bullied. I'm an artist. I having this hard time about something. I'm a gamer and I'm in, my friends don't like, understand like all this stuff uh, that they would go through that was related to my character and of course to me because I was that character back when I was their age and that made me feel so good because they're like well I'm gonna be like Maddie I'm not gonna let you know these this bother me anymore I'm gonna rise above it whatever the situation was and I realized the power of fiction at that moment like I didn't able to give myself a happy ending in that but I was able to give other people a happy ending and you just see how powerful a story can be when you tell it and and share it with other people all right, so uh, I think my last thought on that would be that haters are going to hate and creators are going to create and I hope you all will be creators and not haters. And now we're going to switch gears a little bit. Um, I've told you a lot about writing and a lot about me. And I think it's kind of fun to end with some publishing secrets. You know, there's a lot of you know misconceptions. We don't really know uh, everything about publishing, um, you know, what goes on behind the scenes. So I'm going to tell you a few things. All right, so the first one is authors do not get to design their own covers. Most people don't realize this. They think that I am going to, you know, create my own cover and, you know, maybe even draw it. But as I, you know, as I told you, I can't draw to save myself. And so uh, authors do not get to design their own covers. In fact, they have whole art departments at publishers who are in charge of doing some of these things. So you can see the Camelot Code, the Once and Future Geek. I showed you the actual original cover and we can see it again here. Uh, but this was an early drawing of it where they're kind of being sucked into the computer screen. And so they decided maybe they didn't want that one. And so they tried this one, which is a little bit similar, but you have Sophie in the background, not exactly helping out and Stu pulling out the sword himself. And, um, here it is in color, so they must have kind of liked this one. But then my editor said, oh, wait, but Sophie actually helps him pull the sword out of the stone. She doesn't physically do it, but she uses her magic. And so they decided to do a cover where they're both doing it. So they're, you know, a teamwork. And uh, they kind of like this. So they ended up with this, which is the original artwork before they put the cover on. So you can see a cover can go through many, many different versions. What version did I see as the author? Only this one only this one. They said, here's your cover. I never got to see all that behind the scenes stuff until much, much later. Um, the other thing I want to tell you is that authors don't get to decide whether our books become movies. And no, we can't get you apart, even though we wish you could. Uh, the way it works is I would sell my rights um, to my book to a Hollywood producer or director or whoever, and they would then take that and get a screenwriter and make a movie, and I would have nothing to do with it. That's why some books are very, very different than the movies that end up from them. It's because the author is not involved in any way. In fact, I might not even get to see it until I get my ticket and go sit down in a movie theater seat. Percy Jackson and the Olympians, The Lightning Thief, was a very good example of this. In fact, Rick. Riordan hates this um, movie. He tells people on Twitter that he will block them if, <laughs> if they talk about this movie. Uh, and he really wants to get it remade, it sounds like, um, because the movie was very, very different than the book. And if you've seen both or read the book and seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about. 
Uh, another misconception is most authors are not super rich. Uh, you know, it takes a long time to build up an audience and a readership and a publishing history where you can actually support yourself as an author. Um, in fact, most authors, many authors anyway, have day jobs. So they're lawyer authors, doctor authors, librarians, teachers, any job you can think of, someone might be writing on the side. Like I told you before, I was a TV news producer and I published books on the side for many years before I made it into my full-time job. And uh, it takes a lot of work and time to write a book. In fact, I could sign a contract to write a book in three years later, the book might actually come out. And so that's a long time, um, you know, where I'm writing the book, editing the book, they're creating covers, they're correcting it, you know, they, they print the books, so much happens. So it could be two, even three years from a book sold to a book published. Uh, speaking of books published, these are the next two that are coming out. We got Dragon Ops on May 12th, so that's really, really soon. And then Dangerous Secrets is October 3rd. So you can see how far ahead we were. And I've actually already written Dragon Ops 2, and that's with being edited as we speak. And that won't come out until 2021. So you can see kind of the timeline of all how this happens. And the last thing I want to tell you is you don't need a publisher to publish a book. In fact, there are lots of online resources if you want to go on it your own. Kindle, like the Amazon ebook service, you can actually upload a book onto Kindle um, yourself for free and have that book available for people to buy. Or maybe more like for younger people, um, there are services like Wattpad or Storyboard where you can upload your story and make it available for free for people to read and they can actually comment on it. So it's really fun because you get a readership. And one of the great things about being an author is when people read your stuff. That's, that's the most fun. So um, these are other options. If you're just starting out and you want to get your book in front of other readers, you might try one of these services. Uh, lastly, I will say you don't have to be published to call yourself a writer. You just have to write. So if you're out there and you want to write, you have a story inside you or maybe 10,000 stories inside you, just don't call yourself a wannabe writer or I might be a writer someday. You are a writer now. All right, if you like this calm presentation, um, I have a whole uh, web series called the Once and Future Writers Club, where I have lots more videos that go in much more in depth with some of the topics we talked today. So you can go onto the website, which is the Once and Future Writers Club uh, or my YouTube channel, um, and you can find these resources. If you have any questions, also, um, you can contact me through those platforms or through Instagram. Um, a Twitter and ask me some questions uh, and I will answer them because I know we're not doing this live. However, because we do have a moderator on this panel, uh, on this talk, uh, we are going to do a little Q&A now. So I think that's probably a good time to jump in and do something like that. Hi, Mary. Thanks so much. Hey. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, so you write for Disney. Um, mm -hmm. So I have to ask you first, what is your favorite Disney movie? Oh, uh, um, I mean, right now, I think Frozen 2, just because I've seen it 5,000 times when I was writing the book, like I have to go back to the theater because they, they gave me a script, but not like the screening, you know, like, um, you know, the screening of the video because of the movie because yeah. it just come out. So I watched it over and over again. So I'm really like, I really love that one. But maybe of all time, I really like Sleeping Beauty because I love Maleficent. I love the Disney villains. <laughs> that's awesome. And I do have to say, I'm very excited to read your Frozen 2 book. Um, that sounds really, really cool. Thank you. Um, so next question, you talked about writing what you like. And I think, you know, a lot of us have a million interests. So when you're looking at that blank page, like, how do you decide which idea or topic is the one that you want to write about then? Is it just like a feeling? Do you have to work through it? Yeah, and I'm gonna stop sharing the screen so I can get a little high. Yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, so it really is hard because you are going to be with a book for a very long time. So you have to really fall in love with the idea. So I will have a lot of ideas and kind of working on little you know, thoughts and ideas before I commit to a certain project. And sometimes I'll work on it for a little while and be like, ah, and I put it aside. And there are books where I came up with the idea five years ago and then I'm finally ready to write the book. So yeah, you it has to be the right book at the right time. 
and you have to really be interested in it. I know there's a lot of talk about trends. Like sometimes it's really, you know, everyone wants to write a book about a dystopia or, or everyone wants to write a book about vampire or whatever it is at the moment. And you have to be careful not to follow those trends and really write what you want. Because by the time you start writing a book about that trend, it's over. You know, it, by the time you would get it published, everyone had already done it and, and you moved on. So just try to block out the noise and write what you feel like writing. Awesome. Yeah. And so um, when you have like an idea, you're in it, you're ready to start writing. Um, what does your writing process look like? Do you have any rituals that you do beforehand? <laughs> um, do you write in the morning, at night, whenever you can? Yeah, it's interesting because when I was a full-time TV producer, the only time I had to write was in the morning. My job started at 10, which is pretty late. So I wrote, woke up in the morning and I would write and then I would go to work. And so I was so ingrained in that habit that now, even now, my best time to write is first thing in the morning, which is really annoying because I could write all day, except I write really well in the morning. So I set my alarm. I wake up in the morning, like 5 a.m. I write. I bring my daughter to school when we're doing that. Uh, and um, then I come home and I might even take a nap because I've woken up so early, but at least I got that writing done. And it's great because it's a time when the internet's not active, like no one's doing anything. It's very peaceful and I can be at one without any interruptions. Yeah, that's so cool. And I do love that you mentioned that you were a TV news producer before you were a writer and you were doing the thing at the same time, you know, and that's not uncommon for writers. So many writers have like multiple jobs, they switch careers around a lot. Um, so how did being like a TV news producer affect your writing life? And like, how has it influenced you moving forward, you know, leaving that career and being a full time author? I think one of the things that was really hard being a TV news producer is um, that there were a lot of not happy endings. The news is usually, as we all know, especially right now, not happy. And so you come home and you feel drained and you just feel like, oh, reality. And so it was so wonderful to jump into something fictional where, again, you can have hope, you can have a happy ending and you can, you know, make things work out okay. And so that's a feeling of power that I had. And that was really, really enticing as a TV news producer to be able to do something a little like happier. So I think yeah. that's kind of how it influenced me. Yeah. And writing is definitely, you know, an escape, a way to process things. Um, and so that's really cool. Yeah, um, so the last question, um, what is your favorite part of being a writer? Hmm. My favorite part about being a writer, I think, is interacting with readers. And that's why I like to do things like school visits and all that, because really getting in front of the kids or adults or whoever it is, um, you know, who, who are reading it, that's and hearing their reaction and how it maybe it made their day better, or maybe they really laughed at a certain part or whatever. And just having that feedback and knowing that my story touched someone in some way um, is really like a powerful feeling. Because sometimes as an author, you are sitting home alone and your computer and just you and the computer and it feels very isolating. And so being able to get out there and meeting readers is really the, the most fun part, I think. Yeah, well, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you, it was really fun. I hope everyone uh, stays home, stay safe, all that good stuff. And we, uh, next year we can see you guys in person. <laughs>